Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Do you hear me? It is a great honor to be addressing you today. Public procurement is a matter of immense economic and legal significance. The EU directives on public procurement set out the procedures and substantive rules which public authorities, as well as bodies governed by public law, must follow when procuring contracts of a certain pecuniary importance. This legal framework is designed to ensure transparency, absence of discrimination on grounds of nationality, and equality between bidders. However, some exemptions also apply here. In a situation where the annual value of public procurement contracts in the EU is estimated at 1.9 trillion euros, representing 14% of the EU GDP, the scope of these exemptions carries a lot of weight. For my presentation, I have therefore chosen a rather straightforward approach. When do EU public procurement rules apply? But more importantly, when do they not apply? What kind of speech are you expecting from a judge? Most probably that she is going to speak about cases. In this respect, I will not disappoint you. Before providing an overview of some of the most interesting recent cases, I think it is useful to give you a few words of explanation about the role of the Court of Justice with regard to public procurement matters. The Court of Justice of the European Union interprets and applies EU law. The institution is comprised of two courts, the General Court and the Court of Justice. These courts deal with cases concerning all fields of EU law, including public procurement. How do public procurement cases get to the Court of Justice? Generally speaking, there are two ways. First, the General Court decides actions lodged against acts adopted by the EU institution in the context of their own public procurement procedures. The Court of Justice deals with appeals upon judgments of the General Court. I will not consider these cases today. Second, the Court of Justice also receives preliminary references that is, questions referred by member states' courts when they need to interpret EU law or when doubting the validity of an EU act. This judicial dialogue is a cornerstone of the European judicial system. Before answering a request for a preliminary ruling, the court verifies if it is competent to do so. For example, the awarding of public contracts which are below a certain value does not fall within the scope of the EU public procurement directives. In such case, the situation is in principle governed by national law. There are nevertheless cases where the court considers that it is competent to reply when the public procurement contracts present a certain cross-border interest despite the value. In these cases, the National Court must provide information of the existence of such cross-border interest in its reference to the Court of Justice. In the recent Technoedi case, the Court clarified the task of National Courts in this regard. It considered that the existence of a cross-border interest must be real, not hypothetical. It is important to understand that the Court of Justice is bound by the referring order from the National Court. It does not investigate the facts of the case, but relies on the presentation 
that is made by the national judge. Similarly, the Court of Justice relies on the national court's presentation of the domestic law. However, the Court of Justice interprets only EU law, not national public procurement rules. The court is also bound by the terms of the questions, meaning that it does not usually go beyond what is specifically asked by the national court. Nevertheless, despite being preliminary, a judgment given by the court of justice is binding not only on the court referring the questions, but also also, as to the interpretation of the relevant provision of EU law, it is binding on all member states. I will now uh, move on to speak about recent judgments of the Court of Justice, which have added some interesting new elements to its case law on the scope of EU public procurement law. My speech will mainly focus on the development of the court's case law regarding in-house exemption and exemptions in specific sectors. I must also emphasize that all my comments are strictly personal. The so-called in-house exemption has its roots in settled case law of the court, namely Teckel and commercial versus Germany. According to the Teckel case, a contracting authority is exempted from initiating a procedure for the award of a public contract on condition that it satisfies a dual requirement. First, it must exercise control over the selected contractor legally separated from that authority, similar to uh, which it exercised over its own departments. Second, the successful contractor carries out the essential part of its activities with a contracting authority or authorities to which it belongs. The Germany, um, Commission was a Germany case extended the scope of the TECAL exemption. Public procurement rules do not apply for the arrangement between several contracting authorities directly entering into an arrangement for mutual cooperation. This type of arrangement has to be governed solely by objectives in the public interest. The Court of Justice has further developed its jurisprudence on this topic and I will be focusing on two recent cases, Undis Servizi and Lit Spec Met. The judgment of uh, the court in Undis Servizi added to the body of case law interpreting the Tecal exemption. The Italian municipality of Sulmona awarded a contract for waste management to Cogesa. Cogesa uh, is a wholly public capital company owned by several municipalities in the region of Abruzzo, including Sulmona. Later on, after the award of the contract, the shareholder municipalities agreed to exercise joint control over Cogesa, similar to that uh, exercised over their own departments. The region of Abruzzo required Cogesa also to treat and recover urban waste of other municipalities. These municipalities were not shareholders of the company. A commercial rival of Cogesa argued that the contract could not benefit from the in-house exemption because the conditions relating to control and the essential activities of the decal test had not been met. In his judgments, the Court of Justice provided some useful guidance on the Tecal test. Firstly, the Court considered 
how the services provided by Cogesa to municipalities, which were not shareholders of this company, should be taken into account for the application of the in-house exemption. According to the court, these local authorities must be considered as third parties. They have no control over that company. And therefore, there is no specific link between the contracting authority and the contractor as required by the case law. Even though duties had been imposed on Cogesa by the public authorities, this made no difference to their classification as activities for third parties. To determine whether the conditions of the in-house exemption are met, the referring court has, however, to clarify whether the activity of COGESA for these third parties is merely marginal compared to the activity of the local authorities controlling it. And secondly, the court assessed whether COGESA's activities for its shareholders before taking joint control of this company could be taken into account in view of the in-house exemption. In order to determine the essential part of its activities, for the court, it is immaterial that the agreement for joint control by the contracting authorities took effect after the contract was awarded. Past activities may be indicative of the importance of the activities that COGESA is planning to carry out for its shareholders after the entry into force of the joint control agreement. In other words, all relevant circumstances of the case can be taken into account to decide if the conditions for the in-house exemption are met. In this context, it is important to note that the 2014 General Directive has now clarified and codified the exemption. It provides that more than 80% of the activities of the controlled entity must be carried out in the performance of tasks entrusted to it by the controlling contracting authorities. For the purpose of determining this 80%, it is possible to consider the average total turnover, or an appropriate alternative activity-based measure, such as cost incurred for the three years preceding the award of the contract. The second case I would like to speak about is a recent Litspec Met case, which relates to the obligation for in-house entities themselves to comply with public procurement rules. The dispute arose out of a simplified tendering procedure, where the notice was published by VLRD, a commercial company established as a subsidiary of the Lithuanian State Railway Company. VLRD manufactures and maintains locomotives and railway carriages. In national proceedings, a contractor, Litspec Met, sought to have the contract annulled and the publication of a new notice. The question submitted to the court was essentially to clarify whether VLRD, which also carried uh, out business in the private sector, could be qualified as a contracting authority. The court considered that the subsidiary may well be body governed by public law. To the court, it was irrelevant that VLRD carried out other non-general interest activities. The only important consideration is that the aim of establishing the subsidiary was to meet needs of general interest. Contracting authorities should bear this case in mind 
when forming subsidiaries. Had the subsidiary in question been created to compete on the open market purely for purposes of independent profit and being prepared to bear the possible losses? The answer from the court may well have been different. Now, uh, I would like to discuss uh, the scope of EU public procurement rules from the perspective of specific sectors. Two cases are topical in that respect. The first is a Malpensa case. It concerns the allocation of facilities to service providers on airports. This case sheds new light on the application of public procurement rules to special uh, sectors, such as those covered by the 2004 Sector Directive. This directive applies in the area to activities relating to the exploitation of a geographical area for the purpose of providing airport services to air carriers. As a an Italian court asks the Court of Justice if the award by Malpensa Airport of a hangar to a company, Beta Trans, for the provision of uh, ground handling services was subject to public procurement rules. A competitor operating at the same airport, Malpensa uh, Logistica Europa, claims that the allocation was unlawful because it was adopted without any prior tendering procedure. In fact, the doubts of the referring courts court arose due to Italian law implementing the 2004 directive as interpreted by Italian courts. According to the referring court, the exploitation of airport areas in connection with the airport activities falls within the scope of the public procurement rules governing special sectors. The Court of Justice clarified that the allocation of the areas within airports to ground handling operators does not fall within the scope of the public procurement rules. This is because the contract at issue in the main proceeding, as described by the referring court, cannot be classified as a service contract. In fact, the managing body of the airport did not acquire a service provided by the supplier in return for remuneration. A condition was therefore lacking to trigger the application of public procurement rules. Does this mean that an airport operator has free reign when it comes to the allocation of airport areas? The answer is no. The court recalls that airport managers are subject to the provisions of a special directive of 1996 on ground handling activities. The space available for ground handling at an airport must be divided among the various suppliers of ground handling services, including new entrants. In doing so, the airport manager must allow effective and fair competition. To that aim, the allocation of space must be carried out on the basis of the relevant, objective, transparent and non-discriminatory rules and criteria. However, the prior tendering procedure is not mandatory. In view of these conditions, it seems that the organization of an open selection procedure based on predefined rules or criteria could still be the best option to comply with the requirements of EU law. The last case I would like to mention is a pending case, Commission versus Austria. It concerns the obligation to carry out a tendering procedure for the award of a contract for the manufacture of official documents, such as biometric passports, identity cards, driving licenses and residence permits. The court was asked to clarify 
whether a member state can derogate from EU public procurement rules on the ground of public security reasons. Let me start with uh, some background elements. This case is slightly different from the other cases I have presented. Advocate General Cocot delivered her opinion on 20th of July 2017, but the court has not yet decided the case. Second, it is an infringement procedure initiated by the European Commission against the Member State for not complying with EU law, and it is not a reference from a national court for preliminary ruling. I should also stress that the Grand Chamber is dealing with this case. This shows the importance of the legal issue at stake. In this case, the court will have to decide whether Austria infringed EU public procurement rules by reserving the printing of official documents to the formerly state-owned company, which has now been privatized. The court um, has been asked to decide in substance if security requirements relating to the nature of these documents justify entrusting the manufacture of such documents to a specific undertaking without any public procurement procedure, simply because it considers this company to be particularly trustworthy. I should mention that EU treaties allow a member state to derogate from duties under EU law when it comes to the protection of the essential interest of its national security. Regarding EU public procurement rules, this possibility is fleshed out by special provisions contained in the 1992 Public Service Contract Directive and the 2004 General Directive. Broadly speaking, these provisions stipulate that the rules in those directives do not apply to public contracts. First, when they are declared to be secret. Second, when the execution requires special security measures. Or third, when it is required by the protection of the essential interest of the member state. Austria justified its practice on the basis of the last two options. Advocate General Kokot's opinion calls for a strict interpretation of these derogations. Where a member state shows that the existence of a sufficient national interest is at stake, the derogation from EU law, being an exception to fundamental internal market freedoms, needs to be interpreted strictly. This requires a member state to prove that it is necessary uh, to have a, a recourse to the method taken by it in order to protect its essential national security interest. The Advocate General's point of view is that the arguments invoked by Austria to justify a direct award to an incumbent operator were not convincing. The need for a centralized execution of the printing contracts in particular to monitor the compliance with secrecy and security requirements, cannot justify commissioning the one and only undertaking. Nor does the need for effective official controls, as much less restrictive measures exist. The argument concerning the necessity of a special relationship of trust between that undertaking and the state authority was also dismissed by the Advocate General. By comparison, public contracts in the area of military and security, which are certainly highly sensitive, do not escape from EU public procurement rules. More interestingly, Advocate General Kokot highlights that Austria has not even adopted the necessary measures that would prevent foreign shareholders taking control over the incumbent printing company, such as a golden share. Therefore, the measure that Austria adopted cannot be seen as being implemented in a 
consistent and systematic manner. In conclusion, I am very glad that I have had this opportunity to introduce you to the Court of Justice's case law in the field of public procurement. The selection of the cases presented today is only a glimpse of the Court's jurisprudence. The Court delivered 31 judgments and orders in the field in 2016, and 18 new cases have been brought before the Court so far over the course of 2017. Among them, a case referred by the Swedish Supreme Administrative Court concerning the interpretation of the 2004 Sector Directive. This case is still pending. As you know, from April 2016, new rules govern public procurement in the EU. These rules, harmonized at EU level, guarantee a level playing field for all businesses across Europe. The court's case law gives significant clarification as to how these rules apply. While the cases I introduced to you today were decided under the 2004 set of directives, Recital 31 of the new general directive indicates that the court's case law remains as relevant guidance when it comes to defining the scope of EU public procurement rules. How exactly the court tackles public procurement cases in the light of new directives will no doubt be seen in the very near future. Thank you for your patience and attention. <laughs>